Hello, everybody, and welcome to this second um, 2022 National Danish Book Club. It's really, really nice to see you all. And I love seeing faces I've seen before, and I love seeing new faces. So you are most welcome. And as usual, I want to thank the Scan Design Foundation. Mary DeLorme, who started this, is on vacation in Hawaii. <laughs> yes. So I'm thinking that she's not in the mood to discuss the book, unfortunately, but I will scold her next time I see her. She's been very, very solid at, at every meeting, but we have Lina from Northwest Danish Association. Lina is in charge of making everything function and just having everything go smoothly. And she almost read the book, so, <laughs> so now I... <laughs> I let slip your secret. Yes. Uh, hi, Carol. Hi. So uh, I am just happy that you're here, but you know that we usually have an interview with my colleague Desiree Orbeck from Seattle. And of course, since this is a deceased author, we can't have an interview this time. And Instead of having an expert kind of talk about the book, which we could have done, I can assure you, here are two of the books that I've been looking at just to get more background knowledge. There is so much written about Martin A. Henson and so many analyses and interpretations, and it's very inspirational. And of course, my former colleague, Nils Ingwersen from Madison also wrote a biography with his wife of this absolutely wonderful author. So if you are interested in reading more about him, you know, material just abounds. However, what I wanted to do today is something I don't do every time. I wanted to start out with a PowerPoint so that I could give you a little bit of that background that would otherwise be provided in the interview that Desiree would be in charge of. So I hope you're okay. And I hope I'm not being too much of a teacher by, by sharing, but I did want to share something about him and some more of the details from the book. So I'm going to start screen sharing now and pull up my The Liar. And as usual, please stop. Please interrupt. Please ask questions. There's nothing that is written in stone about this hour we have together. It's all supposed to be enjoyable for all of us. So please make sure that you stop me if I say something that is uh, weird or vague or wrong in your opinion. And I wanna go through this, it's only 14 slides, so it's a fairly quick one. Then I wanna open up the discussion and I have a quote to start out with as usual. And then I really hope you have a lot of thoughts about this wonderful book, as you can tell. I'm very enthusiastic about it. So let us get started. The Liar, Martine Hensen uh, from 1950. The Danish title is Leunon, so a very good translation. Otherwise, like I said in my introduction and the notes, it's difficult to translate because it's a very poetically lyrical book. Martine Hensen's uh, real name was actually, as you can see, Alfred Martin Jens Hensen. So he switched it around a little bit. And I think this picture that I found here is a very good, uh, very good portrayal of his mindset. In other words, he was not a very cheerful person. He was a thinker and a philosopher. And he had a much, much too short life from 1909 to 1955. He was born on Schellen in that little uh, dot there called Ströbük. So that area of Denmark here, oops, sorry. Uh, this area is called Stevens. And the main city is Storhildinge. Stones is famous in Danish lore for being the place in Denmark where the fairies live. And there is a little river. And once you cross that river, 
our realm of the fairies. He did not have an enchanted life or childhood, especially because his father was a very, very poor tenant farmer. So no fairies at his uh, cradle. Very little money, but very strong faith. His mother was taking care of the children. She came from an even poorer background than the father. And together, they worked very, very hard their entire life. Look at the number of names. This was actually an interesting sign of being older. Because in my generation of Danes, so we're talking, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it was normal just to have two names. But back here, in the kind of end of 1800s, 19, uh, you had many more names. She was the one who inspired him. She was the storyteller. The father was the one who inspired his Christian faith. And you know, when I say Christian faith in a Danish context, it means that you are a Lutheran Protestant, not very devout normally. He was much more devout than the norm. He had two sisters and nothing much is known or talked about regarding them. Uh, but, um, you know, they were born a little bit later there, 11 and 14. And then the cause of death. That was nephritis. This, I didn't know, I had to look up. It's a kidney disease. And what happened was that he was a young man out in the country. He fell out of a tree. And he was trying to pick some uh, newly sprung beech branches for the woman that he was working for. And a branch broke and he fell down straight on his head. He actually got up, climbed back up the tree again, and picked the branches. But from that moment on, he suffered from severe migraines and headaches. For that, he ate aspirin. And he ate aspirin, which would be like, um, you know, what would be, I don't know what the comparison would be, but I mean, aspirin um, is a well-known medication and it ruined his kidneys. Then, and you won't believe this, the final thing that did him in was drinking cleaning liquid. And this is, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I was reading about it. He was cleaning off a pair of spots or a couple of spots on his pants, his ni nice pants. He was at a conference and he didn't want to throw this liquid that was kind of poisonous into the sink. So he put it into a glass, a water glass, and put that next to his bed. He woke up in the middle of the night and was thirsty and drank it. Inadvertently, of course. Got sick immediately, went to the emergency room, sat there and waited, and finally they pumped him out, but his kidneys had been damaged even more. And he died way too young, like I said, uh, barely 46 years old in 1955. But what, I mean, that just reading about that was, was harrowing. Here, you see a happy picture. This was the happiest picture I could find. His wife, and they had two children, Hans Ole and Medelise, and they actually looked like a very happy little family. So here we have it. He worked as a farmhand, then he went to the School of Education and became an elementary school teacher, graduated in 1930, got a job in Copenhagen as a graduate school teacher or elementary school teacher, uh, 1931, and worked as a school teacher until he began his writing career in 1935. His last short stories were published posthumously in uh, oh, it should be 1959, sorry about that. Uh, he died in 55, but they were actually published in 1959. And he wrote a number of short stories. If you Google him in Wikipedia and find you know, the Wikipedia entry, you can see very, very long list of writings. 
Second World War influenced him seriously. And that is just something I needed to stop and kind of, um, sorry, I'm trying, I was trying to move my pictures a little bit there. Uh, I wanted to make sure that you knew about his role in the resistance movement. He uh, became an active member and a writer and editor of the illegal newspaper. And he was looking out at this bog, Udasleu Mose, which he called the bloody bog, because that's where the resistance movement executed informers. And that was the view from his window. And of course, that depressed him to a, a really high degree. However, this illegal newspaper asked him to write a defense, an apology, defending these killings of informers. If you have, uh, if you have any interest in this, then there's an excellent movie out about it. Um, um, and I can't remember the name right now, but somebody can help me. The Lemon and what's it called? Oh, the... Citron. Um, yeah, lemon, that's citronin. And what's the oh, other one? The lemon that's and the, the flame. The flame. Yeah, flamme no citron, the yeah. flame and the lemon. Yeah. And that actually talks about this the execution oh. of it. So if you're interested, you know, that's a great movie to watch. And of course, it has Miss Mikkelsen in it. So anyway, so there you, <laughs> you're good. Uh, quite. So he wrote this, you know, he was torn. He was so uh, anxious about writing this, but he ended up writing a 12 page long Socratic dialogue. And he says, okay, the occupational forces grew in strength because people were way too compliant and not actively resistant and that the informers were, you know, they needed to be executed and that he was torn and racked by guilt about this for the rest of his life. So he wrote this book and it is hailed by everyone who's anything as one of the decidedly major classics of Danish literature. And did you know that it was actually started as a radio reading? So a Danish actor read it on the radio, 12 chapters and narrated, then it became a serial in a newspaper. Finally, it was published as a book. And in 1970, it was a movie. So there's also a movie for you to watch if you're interested with quite a few famous Danish actors from the time. And it's definitely, as I say, retained its seductive quality. So let's talk just a little bit about it. He did make this sketch of the island, which is a fictive island. It does not exist. There is one in Norway, but there's no Senu in Denmark. So somewhere we have the mainland, we have the city, no names. We have a few named sandbanks and other islands. So it's within geography, but also without geography. But you do know that Senu has an ambivalent meaning, and you need to know that. Sen is sand, but it's also truth. So we are getting the theme of the book, namely truth versus lies, right from the beginning. Johannes V wants to write the truth about himself, but hmm, constantly he finds this hidden motif that makes him a liar. And the only thing that's really truthful is the island. And we can speculate that that's why he ends up wanting to write the story of the island. Well, I promised a little bit about some of the three poets that I mentioned in my questions. Amposio Stup is the one who stands for the erotic. He's a classicist poet and he had a muse with whom he was very much enamored, who is comparable to both Rimo and Enemari. He was a failure. So here we have actually failures too. He never graduated. He went to the university for 10 years, didn't get his degree, married, had no income, was a pauper and didn't pay taxes because of low income, which is really kind of 
embarrassing at that time. Then his wife died, family took care of the kids, he couldn't do it, and he drank too much his entire life, had arthritis, and died um, at 53. Okay, that was the first poet he mentions a lot. Next one was another failure. However, Stein Steensen Blegel is really important in the book. He's a Danish minister and author born in Vium. His father was also a minister. We're in the middle of Jutland here. He studied in Copenhagen and he got his exam, became a minister in Mid Jutland. That's where they have a museum for him. He was just like Johannes V, interested in nature and hunting. And he had his best moments when he was out with his dog. So a very clear parallel to our protagonist. He married, had a very unhappy marriage, ran away from it out on the moors and roamed around and always had financial worries. They always lived above their means. He felt very unappreciated, but you know what? He wrote in the vernacular, the way the peasants spoke, and he introduced that to real Danish literature. If you have never read anything by him, please do so. He also drank too much, okay? So he was depressed about his life and his wife. So he was fired and he would rather write than be a minister and then he died. He was inspired, like I said, by the Moors. His main works are four, from the diary of a parish priest, the Hoshir, hello dog, and the Paris priest in Bailby. Please read one of them. If you haven't read anything by him, you will be enchanted. They're very short. The poetry, Birds of Passage, is a very important theme in the book. The time approaches when I must leave is the first uh, stanza. And then it's all about leaving and being a bird of passage, a migrating bird. And finally, Charles Gendrup, he wrote, Happiness is neither goods nor gold. I, this is my primitive translations, everybody. Most happy is the one who has peace with himself, peace with his God, and peace with his nest, uh, with his neighbor. If things go up and down in the world, he has found the best part of happiness. Okay, so peace. And finally, the folk song. Divine Lörde Aften, it was a Saturday evening. If you want to hear the music, you can just Google and you will find many, many versions. Danish folk song, it's about loss of faith in love. And the last stanza goes, I wanted to pick roses. I'm not picking anymore. I loved you so dearly. I'll never love again. And on this happy note, let's move to our book. <laughs> I hope you, hi Otto, I'm glad to see you. I hope you, um, I hope you enjoyed it. Did you have any questions about it before we move on? You know, I could talk about this guy for hours as usual and I won't. Yes, Otto. I, I, I have a few props with me today. <laughs> I have uh, the, the study for Leunern. It's called mm -hmm. Isenbrüder. Yeah, and it was um, it was uh, his fourth his his study, and it came out in sixty nine. Yeah, and um, book, I got it because 50, yeah. this, this whole experience has been a, a, a bringing me back to my high school days. Actually, we, we read it in high school, and of course, we had to do. A, answer all the questions and write essays about and all kinds of stuff and of course i had to i have the book at home and here and and it is written yeah it's written yes. with capital nouns yeah so it is one of the original from gudendal's bow club i don't know if you remember that and they oh, yeah. also issued this eason brüder as a little christmas uh, gift to members of the book club great so there's an idea for the book club but uh, it, it has the map of the island and you know it has uh, the whole the four the four study to the thing and uh, it, it was it's been great to go into those uh, memories and and just bring it out out from my bookshelf i really enjoyed that 
<laughs> I'm so glad. Did anybody else read it in a Danish high school, the Danske Gymnasium? I did. Otto you and did I. Too. Okay. <laughs> in my second this. year. Yeah. And strangely enough, you know, normally when you read books in high school, you never read them again and you hate them and you hate the teacher. I loved it. It simply enchanted me even as a 16 year old. So that was that was it. I was sold. But I do want to start our discussion with one quote and I'm using the English version. It's chapter five, page 76 in my book. I cannot really play, but I know I can hear the great music. And when a man hears that, he knows then that he's just a fleeting visitor here on earth. Great music belongs to another world. It opens our minds to another world. But just as we think we're coming very close to it, we find it utterly strange. Man is an immigrant in his own birthplace, a passing guest in his own home, a fleeting being on earth. So that was my quote for today because it links up with what I said about Steen Steens and Blicker and these birds of passage. And of course, I want to ask you if you've thought about what he means by man being a fleeting guest on earth, or if there's anything else you would rather start out with, I'm throwing it at you. What would you like to discuss in this absolutely wonderful book? And everybody is very welcome to join in and unmute and start the discussion or answer my question. I thought it was, um, it, it struck me, and this is really near the end of the book. This is page 185. And it made me think that I can't understand his real intent because I was not in a country controlled by the Nazis and I did not live that oppression. And, and he, he said, um, you mustn't go around with an after the war mentality. And I thought, mm -hmm. You're right. I don't have that experience, and I I think that so affected his his writing. Yeah. And what do you think, Joan, that he meant with an after the war mentality? That that you can't shake it. You lived it. It becomes part of your being, and that's also why it's hard for me to understand because I did not live it. Yeah. And of course, I didn't live it either, but my parents did. And it weighed very heavily on everybody's mind. And that's why that movie is a really good example. If you want to be in that mindset of what's it like to live. And of course, there are other movies that depict the occupation, which was difficult for Danes. And difficult for him also finding his place and not feeling guilty because he really did not believe in the execution of the informers. He was a pacifist. And of course, I know that when I did my little presentation, I did not mention Søren Kierkegaard. But I do hope that you can all see that he is deeply, deeply affected by Kierkegaard's doubts and beliefs, and that there's a lot of religion in the book. Even think about Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel is from the Bible, and he's the one who's without deceit, as Jesus says. And that is that duality. So all through the book, we have that basic duality and ambivalence between truth and lies, between what is perceived and what is real. And I do hope that you all had in your mind, okay, we have 12 chapters. We also have 12 apostles, etc. So 11 of the 
first chapters are all hindsight, even though it's portrayed as being written in the now. We get to chapter thir- or chapter 12, and we know, oh, it's 13 months ago that I, all this happened. I'm just writing it down now. It's hindsight. And so he's been pretending all along to take us on this journey. And he's been writing to Nathaniel without deceit. And yet, what is he? Is he a liar? And who is he a liar for? I mean, the title of the book, did that, you know, did that kind of uh, spark any thoughts in you? Are we all liars? Are we not only guests on earth, but migrating birds, but also liars? And whom are we lying to? Is it ourselves? Is it our neighbor? What is it he wants to say? And I, you know, I can also ask all the juicy questions. Now, who's he really in love with? (laughs) You know, um, we can go wherever you want to go because that's also a very, very interesting question. Is he really in love with Anamari? Or is he not? I think the love, can you hear me? I don't know. I I think um, that he's lying to himself. And I took the idea of Nathaniel being us, the readers, actually. It could be his alter ego, but I, I, I personally took it as us, us as the readers of his work. And I felt that it came to a point when he was preaching the sermon and the cleansing of the woodcock and, and all of that. I think that that was a turning point in the book that I perceived that then he was admitting that he was a liar or uncomfortable with what he was and drinking an awful lot all the way through. Sometimes people who do that are covering, you know, serious feelings of doubt. So. Any comments to that? So Linda is focusing on that very essential scene in the church where he's reading about, well, the spirit that is unclean that he is sending away, but then after he is swept and cleaned, the spirit returns with seven other evil spirits. And for that man, it is worse than before. This is also a theme, again, in Steen, Steens and Pliga. Lots of parallels. Uh, so then as he is standing there did you all read that that is a very very uh, poignant scene Linda that you're pulling out he's standing there and he's thinking evil thoughts am I the only one who thought he was thinking evil thoughts he's looking at his congregation and he sees them as enemies he feels that he's low-key and he's been possessed by something evil. And he's asking the widow, the widow of the man whose boat was blown up by a mine, left over from the war, right, Joan? So we're back there with the war. And he's saying, so has Jesus helped you? And when she says yes, it's as if he's being hit. Somebody's slapping him, and all of a sudden, he has or has to succumb to goodness, and he has to move on, and he is cleansed. Something happens there. How did you, did anybody else read that scene differently? I would really be interested in hearing that, because that's how I perceive it. When I heard it. Sorry. I think he he came to that sermon and realized he was no better than anyone else. He was no more pious. He was human Mm -hmm. and with a lot of faults, like drinking, you know, and and uh, and who am I with faults to stand up before all of you and preach? To you, you know, I, 
it makes me a liar to presume I have I'm more holy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come again. Yeah, I was going to say at that point too for me it was a turning point in in the book that was when i all of a sudden kind of woke up and went okay now we are seeing a little bit in his soul what's going on for him and that idea of being possessed by the devil and that idea of looking at others in this very very hateful way this is truly how i see you now it was a, a bit shocking it reminded me and i could be wrong that hansen himself as he evolved in his own life went through a period of time when he was an atheist and then you see you know with the war and with his writing he moves towards Kierkegaard and then he also becomes uh, more faithful so you wonder how much we are seeing of the author's own uh, kind of journey uh, towards more spirituality to some extent yeah that spirituality kind of is uh kind of counteracted by him drinking the altar wine you know it's, 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 it's all, he is he is such a um, complicated uh figure right he goes, he's able to play the organ, he goes to the church, he fills it with beautiful music, and yet he is doubting, and he's doubting, but after maybe, after that middle scene, when, when she confirms that Jesus helped her, his widow, then he may have found his faith again. It, it, it was an intense chapter. I'm Absolutely intense. And I, I, I had to find it interesting that when he ends it, he, he simply states, yeah, maybe I am drinking a little too much, which I just thought was so interesting, you know, after you, okay. you know, you were hauled through this chapter to hear that statement. <laughs> That's a great, uh, you know, a great point. Yeah. From elevated I, spirituality to alcohol. Yeah. Auto. I think if I may say something, um, I, I think the parable uh, from the New Testament there, mm -hmm is uh, a very important part of the book and 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 the idea of uh, being cleansed and then the next uh, thing ha happening afterward will be worse mm -hmm. i think it is the way he sees himself uh, and his first falling in love is maybe the unclean spirit that he is trying to get rid of Mm -hmm. And and after he got rid of that one, he's he the only thing he kept was that little necklace there, and the memory that he that he kind of denies himself to go into, and and that he uses as a teaser for Anna Marie, and that he kind of uh, plays around with. He's really good at at uh, at reading other people and their motives, but his own motives he's always hiding. So I think that parable is, is, is like his own life. And, and then what happens when he runs away with Remo and, and becomes, you know, the unclean spirit that comes back uh, with many more. And, and, uh, and, 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 and finally, when, when that, ha that has happened, um, he does manage to get rid of his thing. Uh, after they went out and shot the the bird and uh, and uh, then he can take his his fate onto himself and live what he was supposed to live you know the the lonely life and and uh, uh, maybe 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 he'll get another dog one day but uh, you know suffering is he is part of his life from now on you know he's denying himself the right Ooh, there's a lot to think about in what Otto said. So does anyone have any comments? Because I want to pick up on suffering. Yes. And what life is he meant to live, everybody? Mm -hmm. He has two women who obviously like him. Why doesn't he? Did you all make that clear to yourself? Why doesn't he pursue Anamari, who is so clearly waiting for him to make a move? Why doesn't he go after her? She is the woodcock. She's the seducer. Yeah, she is. But uh, he he all, he has a, a an opposite feeling too because she was a pupil 
Yeah. And you know, you cannot uh, make a, 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 a teacher cannot make a, a relationship with a pupil, not even after. Oh, so, yes. So he has, oh, yes. he has oh, no, uh, Otto. Otto, you a lot can of do doubts that. about that whole relationship. Oh, no, no. In Denmark, you're fine. I mean, you can't have a relationship while you're a teacher student, but afterwards, no problem. Yeah. This is Denmark, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> this, is, this is the 40s, right? Or the 50s. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so at that point, uh, one thing back to that uh, scene in the church, um, what he experiences is the anticipation of the congregation as the enemy, not the mm -hmm. people, but, but he, he's, he, he is struggling with, should I live up to people's expectations or should I just do my dharma, my, my, my duty, uh, mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. Um, uh, so, so that's a struggle with him too. And, and the same thing with, he sees himself as a teacher more than anything else, not as a preacher. Yeah. He just fills in on that role. He really is the teacher uh, and he yeah. loves that uh, that role that he has there. And we can all agree that he's a good teacher, right? He awakens mm -hmm. curiosity, he takes them on journeys, he tries to open their horizons and widen their minds, and he's doing all the right things that a teacher should, even staying away from that student who is obviously mm -hmm. willing to start a relationship. Okay, everybody, why does he call uh, the engineer Alexander? <laughs> and wh why is he so evil? He's evil to the poor Harry engineer. Why? Harry has good intentions. How is that relationship playing out for you? Somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm well, sure. Let me say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think okay. he's referring to Alexander the Great who conquered the world. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's the way I understand it anyway. He's mocking him. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But what do you think? I mean, he's really, he's not very nice to Alexander. He's incredibly protective towards Olof, the fiance, fiance. And I want to, I want all of you to think of Olof's mother. Okay, first of all, does anyone remember her name? Uh, Marie. Yeah, Marie. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Maria. And Marie. And Marie, oh. Marie, uh huh. How how is their relationship? Bad. Very no. bad. Marie yeah. hates Anna Marie. Why? Did you think about what those two women represent then in the book? Because then you can see Johannes. Oh shoot! I forgot to read that. You know, wonderful passage. See ikke mit navn for hurtigt. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. I mean, that's the best passage in the entire book, right? See, I can now for what you got that the speed, the deceit, right? Never mind. How is that okay. translated oh. in English, by the way? Don't say my name too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but the sweet, you know, yeah, how no, is that? No, they, they Did they up. get the pun, the translating, yeah. the, the, the play yeah. on words? They, no. No. Okay, tell me, Marie and Anna Marie. What do those two women stand for? And how do they kind of squeeze them in the middle? What do you see them standing for? Does anybody think about that? It's not a coincidence that they have such similar names. What do you think Anamari stands for, the way she's described? So Mary are we Magdalene. talking about Mary Magdalene? Yeah. yeah. I don't think so. I don't know how. What is Anna Marie? Is she Mary um, Magdalene and and Mary, oh, his mother? Is that the contrast? That might be it, but I think it's more because Anna Marie. Don't you see her as uh, as uh, heiress? Don't you see her as uh, erotic temptation? Oh. Yeah. Well, that's what, what was I Mary think. Magdalene considered at the time. I don't know. Was she also erotic? She was considered a fallen woman. She was a prostitute. Yeah. yeah. There you go. 
that would be the same. And what would the mother be then? Virgin Mary. Virgin Mary, <laughs> right. Thanks, you, guys. Uh, one more thing that I want you to think about. She also stands for the law. Oh, remember the mother? Her? Yeah, the mother. Remember when he talks about her, he says, she came to the island. She stayed. She does everything that is right. By the book. Yeah. By the book. She stands for the law. And that does not work very well with Anna Mari, who stands for eroticism and happiness and joy and who actually wants something out of her life except duty and doing things by the book. That was actually how I saw them in terms of the old versus the new. So you have the old fashioned way, you have the new way where Anamari is, you know, showing us what can be on the other side because she's and, a little oh, bit sorry. looser. <laughs> and how does he react to that? How does he feel? Christine, how do you think, how does he feel in the middle between these two women? I think he's torn between what he wants in terms of, do you go with the old or do you go with the new? Because in some respects, you would think that he should be rejecting the new because of who he is, the teacher, the priest, whatever you want to call him. And, and so I think he's torn. a little bit, right? And aging, yes. Yeah. So do you see, he is so torn between these two women. What happens when he visits Olaf's mother? He looks at the family album. There's your history. There's your law. That's how you do it. And Anamari is this bird who is just fluttering all around. Okay, so why then, and this is my, not my biggest question, but one of my bigger question, why then when finally the law has been kind of followed, Oluf and Anamari have officially broken off their relationship. Why then does he make that frantic dash to get to her? What do you think? It seemed like hidden things, hidden things we didn't know about. Such as, Joan? A relationship that was hidden from us. But didn't you feel that all along there was an undercurrent of those two kind of in and out? I, and I guess I, I didn't want to see it because he was the teacher. Mm, okay. There, there and was... I think it, it, it also had to do with his loyalty toward Olaf, of course. Yes. yes. And, yeah. and it's, it, he goes after Olaf has kind of given him permission. Yes. Um, and, Olaf and... says, you know, good luck. Yeah. Yeah, so Olaf uh, is not crushed and he, he's uh, saying, well, no, no big deal. And that yeah. kind of gives him permission to dash off, but uh, you know, he's, <laughs> he's a little out too late there. <laughs> kind of like yeah, it's a very simple thought that I had. And, and there was a couple of times when I went, I wonder who the, who the father of the son actually is. Is it actually Olaf? And he does seem to say that he yeah. looks like yeah. Olaf, but there's a, a question that I had as to who, who, who the actual father might have been. And the other piece was his, he really likes Olaf, but I think he also knows that Olaf can't hold Anna Marie. So he realizes he still has a chance with her, where I think it's more difficult with Harry, who, who is going to lead her um, away from the island and away from him where he no longer will have that ability to make a choice or to, to connect with her. Just and he, yeah, exactly, Kamarita. I totally agree with you because he's done the thing you do when you're in love with a woman, with a child, you get to be friends with the child, right? Yeah. So little Tom is the one who actually looks up to him as a substitute father when Olaf is away. Yeah. But now the path is clear and he can get her and she's gone. Just like that bird, right? That is lying there in wait, lying in wait, lying in wait. We have so many 
descriptions of that. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden it rises and he's too late. And that, of course, brings us to the other side of the romantic triangle with him at the top, Rimo. Mm-hmm. So everybody, tell me about Rimo. How do you see her? Where does she fit into the story? She's so different. She's a shadow woman, described again and again as a shadow woman. Yet she's married to the richest farmer on the island. She has everything. Is she happy? What is with her? Why do they start a relationship? They actually have sex afterwards. I hope you've got that. I mean, it's kind of discreetly done, but uh, they are. And then what and why? And how does that hook up to the whole theme of lying? How do you see it anymore? I get, I threw a few thoughts at you there. Mm. I saw her again as part of the what ifs. He's basically setting up all these, well, what if this and what if this person and what if this life and what if, if this had happened and what about this? So I just saw him as kind of testing, you know, the what ifs, if that makes sense. But did you see him as having sincere feelings for her? No. But I think that goes back to the whole theme of nobody in this book can be trusted. And ultimately, he proves that he can't be trusted. So I feel like, can we even trust when he says that they did anything? Or can we even trust that she had the feelings that he's saying? So that's what I mean. Can you trust anything? Mm. I felt felt like um, she was left so confused by the war And he was trying to teach her how to let go and how to trust and live again. Yes. And Paul wrote in the chat uh, that after war mentality is accepting the absurdity of the world, who can tell the truth in an absurd world? And that is a really good, uh, a really, really good uh, comment for just this moment with Rimo. Because I see him and Rimo as having really, I I actually disagree with you, Christine. I think they have really serious feelings for each other. I think that they do love each other. And I think she would be ready and willing to up and leave the island with him, leave her husband and start a new life. That's what she says. She is desperate lonely and bored and doesn't know what to do with herself and she's just an appendix to her hyperactive husband Mm -hmm. and she doesn't know what to do with herself and then she has johannes and she says she loves him he says he loves her she says she loves him he says yes it's mutual and then she says oh my god my cookies are burning do you remember that scene (laughs) Yes. And you're thinking, oh, that just took it down from this beautiful, uh, enchanting moment to, okay, let's uh, rescue the cookies. But he also needs to rescue her. Did any of you think, how? How does he rescue her? And I do think they have sex, by the way, Christine. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) I want to, I want to see that. Yeah. I thought he rescued her by um, trying to show her, let go, let go of your fears from the war, from your past, and be here present now and live today and the days forward live today. Yes, good. I, I totally agree. Can I read it? Yeah, I, the one part I didn't quite understand, if the woodcock um, is, uh, Anna Maria is represented by the woodcock, and yet that is the bird that he kills for Rimo uh, to yes. present to her as the first mm-hmm. kill of the season. Um, th- that seemed quite complicated to me, unless he was willing to give up Anna Maria for her, but then eventually he gives up Rimo because she all of a sudden is starting to blossom and, and come into herself a bit. But can I just think about which woodcock does he kill? The second one. Oh, the third. 
Oh, the third. Remember, oh. first it goes out with people and it flies away. Okay. Then it goes out, gets, uh, and it gets three more, goes back, gets three more. And the next one, he lets go. Let's go. So two, he let go. There is an Amari for you. There. Oh, she and then the third one, he shoots. More or less, um, it seems to me kind of haphazardly. Okay, I'm, I'm used to shooting these woodcocks when, when I see them. And then he gives it to her as kind of a um, pledge, maybe. Here you have it. It is a gray bird, but it has colors, just like you need to blossom, like you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how is Emo going to blossom? Not going to leave her husband. That seems to be decided. How is she going to blossom? How does he set her free to find herself and find truth in her life? Did you think about that? Hmm. What does he tell her to do at the end? Yeah. Does anyone remember? He tells her to go and use her talents. He tells her to do things yeah. rather than just wander about aimlessly as the housewife without kids. She doesn't have any children. He tells her to do good for others, be a philanthropist, and use her husband's money and power to start doing good because that will heal her own kind of, well, it's, it's more or less a hollowness inside her. She's hollow and she wants him to fill her up. And he realizes that that's not the role he should be, be uh, playing here. He can't fill her up unless he tears her away from her husband. And that's against his, again, as we see with Olaf, uh, who was just not even married, that's against his moral code. So Rimo is let go. And Amari is let go, and of course, his dog dies. And then the big question is, what does this liar, what does this bird of passage have left at the end of the book? How did you read the ending? Were you depressed? Were you happy? Were you fulfilled? Did you think that he had found his calling, his place on earth? What, in making the scientific inventory of the uh, island? Yes, in yeah. writing this book about the island. What did you think about that, Linda? Well, after I, I may have read it wrong, but after I read that he shot his dog, that was it for me. I just felt pretty alienated from him. I mean, I have a very old dog myself, and I would never shoot him because he was old. So, but I could understand that he wanted to really put something in a concrete way. And so then he began to, you know, focus on the island. Also, he drew the little sick boy into it to try to give the boy hope. I felt that was a very hopeful thing that he did. He, he showed charity in a number of ways towards mm -hmm. Kai towards giving a job to Kai's father, towards the girl who was unwed, who became his housekeeper. I felt that he was trying to do good works to um, counterbalance the negativity that he felt, the yes. ambivalence that he felt. Yeah. I think those are great points. And did you all catch them all? He cuts down this beloved spruce trees, mm -hmm. which means that all of a sudden he can not only see but be seen. He is no longer hiding in his own little lair. And then he takes in this girl who obviously is going to hook up with Olof and make a happy couple. And it's so much unrest and disquiet and unhappiness that she brings. And yet he does, does what she says, this, uh, this kind of uh, unhappy crying little maid. So he's doing charity, yes. And Kai, of course, is also his, uh, you know, part of, of his job is saving other people. So he is coming to terms with life. And the truth, like I started out by saying, is in the island. 
that firm, solid soil of the island and his job as a teacher, a guider of souls towards, you know, finding out what is around them, towards opening their eyes to life. But, I mean, the question remains, as you can see, we, we, I don't think we can agree. Is he still a liar to himself and to others? Is he going to be satisfied? Is he going to forever doubt his decisions? Or is he going to be happy in his coming old age? Never. No. Never. No. No, he's the kind of thinker that will keep hashing it and rehashing it. And not necessarily of what I could have done and how would I do it differently, but I don't see that he would have a peace from all this, not from the way he thinks. No. He's an explorer. He's an explorer of his, of his uh, own beliefs. He's an explorer of his own mind, of his own mindset, of his own beliefs and of those around him. He's an explorer of humans. So in that way, there's almost the biblical um, concept, right? That he's out to find out what kind of humans surround him. And I think he remains the liar, but he's definitely aware of his own lies. And the last chapter tells us that he knows what's going on and how to remedy it. So he does find the closest he can get to this peace of mind. But as you can tell, um, there are so many, many more things. I just want to mention that if you take the chapters and turn them into uh, graphic wanderings. <laughs> oh, Cynthia, I'm happy to hear that. Um, you can draw a map on Senu from what house to house he's walking and believe it or not, it turns into a cross. So this is your biblical connection to uh, physically, it's a cross, he's bearing his cross he is living in the cross. He's living in uh, doubt, but also in religion. And he's trying to make sense of his life. And there's your existentialism following World War II. Yeah. Who am I and who are my surroundings? <laughs> so many, many more thoughts. Uh, and it's worth reading again and again. I can tell you from experience, you find new things every time. And as Lena said, it's a really short book. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, uh, I will invite you to reread it. So, and having said that, I'm also inviting you and hoping to see you again in a month where we are making the biggest leap ever to a very, very modern book, um, which is about as diff different as can be from this classic masterpiece. And uh, then you can decide what you think about that. It's called Mirror Shoulder Blink. And it's all about getting your driver's license. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. No, that's I just wanted, I wanted to try to show you something. I don't know if it'll show up. But this is a Lutheran church in the center of the Jutland Peninsula. Oh, can lovely. Carol, pull it, pull it closer to yourself. Just a little bit. Yes, there you go. We can okay. see it. This church is the one that my great grandfather and the family attended in the center of the Yutlan Peninsula. I was trying to look at the map at the beginning in your, in your uh, uh, slides that you were showing. I believe it's Hardislev is the city it was near. He had a large farm, which he sold when he immigrated to the US around 1885. My grandmother was the next to the youngest, so he was in his 40s when she was born. My mother was next to the youngest in the next generation. I'm next to the youngest, so there are huge gaps of years. Uh, yes. He also owned a cabinet shop, and it had about eight employees. Uh, so there, were, there was money to buy land when they finally got to the US. 
but I somehow ended up with this photograph of the church, the Lutheran church they attended. And at the time that my mother received this and my mother passed away about 20 years ago, uh, the church was still in use. I of course would have no way of knowing now. I actually <laughs> saw where they lived on one of our trips in Europe when we were going from Germany to Sweden. We made, we made a side trip and went up the Ulan Peninsula and then took a ferry onto Sweden just so we could see where they had come from. So I could have a sense of the place. This was right in the middle of the Jutland Peninsula. So this book was that part, that part of the story and the, the author, the part of the mm -hmm. author was interesting yeah. to me with that connection, that physical mm -hmm. connection. So a but Lutheran think church that's in what the middle mean. of the Jutland Peninsula. Yeah. <laughs> it just, you know, that physical connection is, is definitely very strong. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everybody, for showing up tonight. I do hope to see you again. Thank you for your wonderful comments and opinions. And as usual, uh, we almost all agree. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.